co-editor with Noah Ross of the Chatbook Press, Moon Io, and their work has been translated to French and appears in New York 2223, edited by Double Change Collective and translated by Abigail Lang. One more note that I, one more thing I forgot to mention is that we're going to record this meeting, record this uh, this reading, so we can share it with other folks. Um, so turn, just turn your camera off if you don't feel comfortable being recorded. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Carly. Um, I don't know if I've ever been more nervous in my entire life, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I also don't know if I've ever been more um, thankful and appreciative in my entire life. Um, thanks so much um, to you and everyone at Future Poem um, for all of the work and care that you've, um, that you've given to this book. I really, really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Um, and I'm also just uh, so grateful for everyone who's here and um, who's here at this event and who's also here reading with me. Um, transverse, um, I don't know, it's, um, I don't know what to say about it at this point um, because it's been so long, but um, while I was revisiting the book upon its publication, something that occurred to me is that um, a feature of it that I still find um, resonant and important um, to my personal life, I guess, is um, its practices of citation and um, its um, recasting of other people's voices. Um, and so in the spirit of that, I've asked everyone to um, present some of their own work and a cover of someone else's. Um, so I'm really excited to hear all of you um, and to celebrate your work. Hi everyone, it's so good to see so many friends out there and to be reunited with future poem, my future poem people. Congratulations, Lee, um, on this fantastic work that is transverse. I really, I've told you in person um, at great length how much I admire this book. It's meshes, it's mashes of thought and language. It's deep, it's deeply, and we love it. Um, I'm honored to get to celebrate it tonight with all of you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to start with by reading just a very short excerpt from, uh, I hope my camera can work, from Hazel's book, The Little Blue Encyclopedia. Let me see. Right? It's not really showing, but I'll put it in the chat. It's this, uh, it's a book. It's a, it's kind of a hybrid, it's kind of a hybrid genre uh, novel about, um, the loss of a friend, the death of a friend who was obsessed with a television show. Um, and uh, what's the show called? I forget now. Um, anyway, it, it's it's actually an encyclopedia and it, it demonstrates the like obses obsession with this TV show this person had. And so I'm gonna read that entry for F, um, which has, it has this wonderful art in it too. Can you see the, the bird right there? No, yeah. Anyway, it looks like this. <laughs> um, it says Dalton, Dalton Flood, this is the character in the show, is a quiet tugboat driver who seems to spend most of his time writing poetry. There are several shots of him scribbling in a small blue notebook on the deck of his tugboat. The only writing of Dalton's the viewer's glimpse is a rough draft of a poem called Plum Black Coffee. The page is covered with strike throughs and water smudged doodles. Only the poem's final two lines are legible. Here they are. Drifting among the fixed stars, thinking only of sleep. His best friend is Roy Spittle. Dalton is also remembered as the character who trips near Chappie Park on an unexploded bomb, which turns out to be a harmless prop from a low budget comedy that was filmed on Little Blue Island in the 60s. So um, I, I, said, I decided to read that because uh, I'm uh, writing a new book that I feel a lot of affinity with that book because of its intertext and um, its attention to uh, mass visual culture. So I'm, I'm gonna read a little clip from a new performance novel that I started writing under the pandemic 
uh, to amuse and console myself when we couldn't have live performance. So this book is called Boccaccio on Ice. And it's about a team of soap opera stars who are conducting a secret radical archeological dig at night. And by day they star in an ice skating soap opera called Steel Hearts. And this is maybe the opening of the book, I don't know. A moody theatricality is brewing today on the set of the long awaited stage play adapted from the successful television serial, Steel Hearts. A few women are engaged in carefree waiting on opposite sides of a set wall. Between takes, it almost appears that they are actually on the phone. Their idle chit chat, a picture of femme preparedness ripe on the vine. But we know that the phone lines are dead, that everything is fake. This is the theater. While the actors handle the prop telephones, they discuss their hair and the recent verdict. Michelle Jessica, a tall drink of water with short riot girl bangs, twists the long cord with her manicured hand. The mustard yellow phone receiver rests on her shoulder as if it lives there a parrot, shoulder pad, or by some fashion miracle, both. Bianca Fitzcarraldo skates an infinite loop of figure eights as she promotes the long antenna of a pink cordless. Yes, they are ice skating because Steel Hearts is the long running soap opera at the center of Boccaccio on ice. This won't be my first soap opera, nor will it be my last. The director, a convincing Marlon Brando type, takes a long pull from a stage cigarette. Can we get a vintage motorcycle in this play? It's unclear if he too is on an actual phone call or if he's looking for someone, anyone who cares about set design. Today, the director is upset with his set designer, Stephen Myra, who left abruptly on Tuesday. Myra has not replied to the director's endless barrage of text messages. Michelle with Jessica pulls her hair up and puts on a men's vest. Both Michelle Jessica and Bianca Fitzcarraldo's faces change as they prepare to act. At this point in the finished episode, a sultry masculine voiceover will beckon. We now return to Steel Hearts, where Bianca Fitzcarraldo must make a difficult decision. The voiceovers are a throwback to a time when radio and television shared conventions, a time before podcasts and the new loop of radio informing the cinematic conceit of podcasts. A high-pitched digital ring that is obviously fake animates Bianca's cordless. She halts, half shimmies her shoulders, and pours the poutiest, most perfected Goldie Hawn impersonation all over her first line of dialogue. Giancarlo, be still my skates. Where in the twirl have you been, my darling? She blinks several times as, this, as if slamming a door, makes sure to twirl in the precise moment she enunciates twirl, as the director, Max Crandall, instructs. Deep behind a wall partition, yet still visible to the audience, Ms. Michelle Jessica as Giancarlo Lutz intones in a deep voice, Bianca, how I long to be near you. When are you coming back to Port Twizzle, Giancarlo? I'm all alone, afraid to talk to anyone. Bianca hesitates. I cannot skate without you. She puts a little foot out as a modern dancer might. Michelle Jessica as Giancarlo Lutz shares her lament. Lutzing alone is such sweet sorrow, a little crack in his voice. Giancarlo, Bianca quietly asks, is this really you, Carlo? Michelle Jessica doubles down as a desperate Giancarlo Lutz. Bianca, we don't have much time. Tell me, what is it I'm looking for while I'm heartbroken and away? Bianca pushes pause on her Goldie Hawn imp impression. Flatly, she asks, Carlo, you sound unlike yourself, a little off center. Michelle Jessica, as Giancarlo Lutz, brushes Bianca's questions aside, seeing as how she's not actually Giancarlo Lutz, but is merely pretending to be him, the Don Juan of Port Twi Twizzle. Oh, my dear Bianca, he begins. Life on the road as celebrated figure skater, Giancarlo Lutz can be challenging. My blades need sharpening. I can't remember my edges. Is this amnesia? A bad case of skater's block? If you will, Bianca, remind me, what is the big secret that I'm so desperately trying to keep? 
The thing is, Bianca Fitzcarraldo is no stranger to amnesia. She once faked it for an entire year of high school in her hometown of Iowa City, Iowa. It is, she often claims, how she learned to act. So she's not buying NJ's pseudo Carlo charade. Carlo, I'm gonna need you to say our password and I'm gonna need you to deliver it with the same gusto that carried you through the four CCs. Four CC is the Four Continents Figure Skating Championship founded in 1999. As she isn't actually Giancarlo, thus it does not know the password, Michelle Jessica as herself steps out from behind the wall partition, allowing the curled cord to slide indelicately through her palm till it hits the ground. She snarls, why hello Bianca, I hope I haven't interrupted your afternoon snooze. To be continued. Thank you. Thank you, Max. I'm I'm uh, I'm Dan Macklin. I'm founding editor of Future Poem, and um, um, I just wanted to jump in. Um, we didn't get a chance to to introduce all the readers for the evening, so I'm just going to quickly do that, and then we're going to move on to to hear from Sid. Um, so um, that you just heard from Max Crandall. Uh, Max Crandall is a poet, playwright, and director. His performance novel, The Nancy Reagan Collection from Future Poem, made the New York Public Library's best 10 poetry books of 2020, and Lit Hub's 65 favorite books of 2020, and was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in Transgender Poetry. Um, Sid Stite is author of The Undying Present from Krupskaya um, and Stranded Together, forthcoming from the Elephants. Suwako Nakayasu is an artist working with language, performance, and translation, separately and in various combinations. She has lived mostly in the US and Japan, briefly in France and China, and translates from Japanese. Her newest book is Some Girls Walk Into the Country They Are From, Wave Books, and Say Translation is Art, Ugly Duckling Press. And forthcoming books include Pink Waves from Omni Dawn and Settle Her Solid Objects. She is co editor of a Trans Pacific Poetics from Litmus Press, a gathering of poet poetry and poetics engaging trans Pacific imaginaries, as well as of a forthcoming anthology of 20th century Japanese poetry co edited with Eric uh, Sealand from New Directions. Sean D. Henry Smith is an artist and writer working primarily in poetry, photography, performance, and publishing, engaging Black experimentalisms and collaborative practices across and against discipline. As mouthfeel, they collaborate with Imani Elizabeth Jackson, meditating on Black food ecology and ephemeral practices. Henry Smith's debut collection of poems and photographs, Wild Peach, was also published by Future Poem in 2020 and shortlisted for the Penn Open Book Award. In Awe of Geometry and Mornings, exhibited at White Columns, brought to scale photographs from the book alongside a series of readings and conversations programmed with their collaborators. They are also the director of Lunar New Year, their first film. Lina Jinian is a poet, translator, and scholar whose literary career has been long associated with language writing. She is the author of over 25 volumes of poetry and critical prose, the most recent of which are Tribunal from Omnidon Books and Positions of the Sun, Belladonna. A volume of essays titled Allegorical Moments, Call to the Everyday will be published next year by Wesleyan University Press. And the proposition, a critical edition of her early 1963 to 1983, previously uncollected work will be published in spring 20, 2022 in the University of Edinburgh's Press's Foundations of Avant-Garde Writing series. She lives in Berkeley with her husband, the musician Larry Oakes. And with that, I will turn it over to Sid for our next reader. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone at Future Poem. Uh, and thank you, Lindsay, for inviting me. I'm so happy to celebrate this great book. 
And um, especially with these people who are reading beside me, who I have tremendous respect and affection for. Um, as for the um, request to read something by someone else, I was just like, spending time with the bookshelves, like trying to figure out what, you know, trying to feel out what wanted to be read. Um, and I landed on what I think is maybe the very first book of poetry I ever owned and still own, like longest continually owned book of poetry, which is Marina Tsvetaeva. Um, it was given to me when I was like in high school, my uncle Paul was like, oh, you like poetry? Here's some books. And I have this one still. So I'm going to read the first poem in this book, which was written 106 years ago in 1915. Um, and it's called, I Know the Truth. I know the truth. Give up all other truths. No need for people anywhere on earth to struggle. Look, it is evening. Look, it is nearly night. What do you speak of, poets, lovers, generals? The wind is level now. The earth is wet with dew. The storm of stars in the sky will turn quiet. And soon all of us will sleep under the earth. We who never let each other sleep above it. All right, uh, I'm going to read a short bit from my manuscript, which is being published by the elephants um, in a bit. Uh, so thank you to Brock and the elephants for um, believing in this work. Um, it's a collection of writing that I've done over the last five or six years, uh, interspersed with some narrative blips. Uh, I'm gonna read one of the narrative lips that comes early in the book. I have a pretty bad memory. I spend a lot of time thinking about memory for someone who doesn't have a good one. If I had a good memory, I would probably not think about it so much. I'd just have memories. I wonder what causes my bad memory, trauma, forgetfulness. A partner might correct me about my timeline or might say, we already talked about that, remember? I remember things in my own way, like the quality of light in a film or the specks of truth at the core of a story instead of what happens on the surface of the narrative. I might read an entire book and have nothing to say except that it was good because I felt that it was good. I felt it, but I didn't know what to say about it. I just let it move through me trusting that some of its bright debris slipped into parts of my system. I've been writing in journals off and on for most of my life. Nothing spectacular, just narrating events of the day. I don't do this writing as if I'm a poet. In other words, I don't try. It's just me talking to myself. The journal writing has been useful for checking my memory. I may scroll through a notebook from years ago and be forced to confront a narrative that I believe to be true because there it is, written in my own hand, differently. Or I come across something that doesn't change my perception at all, doesn't hold any profound meaning, just a remnant of a previous iteration of myself. I've been reminded through the notebooks that although I have grown and changed, and the world sure has too, my thoughts from over 20 years ago remain similar to the ones I hold now. Not the details, but the overarching concerns. I start to think about what the next book could be. What if I came forward a little more, bared pieces of my life and experiences a little more explicitly? Why would anyone care about the details of my life? Everybody's got rich details of their own life to savor. Some might counter, why would anyone care about writing that obscures the details of your life? Readers are hungry for details of others' lives, driven by a kind of voyeurism that helps make their own life and these times more bearable. Some are drawn to reading others' lives because pieces of the story might resonate with their own, validate something they feel inside but haven't yet articulated, or differ from their lives, offering new angles to think from. Some care less about the details of lives and instead relish in the writing's structure or shifts or style. 
Others might simply let the text move through them, allowing themselves to be speckled by its debris. The year my first book comes out, 2015, I write 30 pages of memory about the community park for my childhood for some reason. I try to map the park out in my mind, but there are just specks of remembrance and mostly gaps. It's the occurrences that stand out, like when the lifeguards at the pool blow their whistles for everyone to get out because there's a turd floating in the water. Or at the playground, I'm on the seesaw with a kid I don't know. I can feel in my gut a sense of distrust in him, but I don't know what distrust is or what a gut is, as in what instinct is and whether I should trust mine. I'm afraid he'll jump off the seesaw when I'm way up at the top and not ease me down or use his words to say, let's stop now and level it so both of our feet touch the ground and we take turns getting off conscientiously. Each up and down we go, he's smiling and I'm smiling because I want to appear like I'm having fun, but inside is fear. Then it happens, he hops off and I crash to the ground. The memory was never written anywhere. Did it really happen? How could I know? I didn't tell my mother who was standing off to the side talking with another mother at the time of the occurrence. Having very few memories from childhood, I wonder why do I remember this incident? It remains because it's preserved in the body, the jolt of the impact as I hit the ground and the lesson that I hold something called instinct and something else that lasts, something like shame. Another one more diffuse, I'm walking along the fence behind a baseball field in the parking lot. The person next to me is a friend, but she's someone I don't meet until I'm 26 years old. She's older than me by 12 years, and she's describing her dissertation as I listen, serving as a sounding board. There's no way this is true because I'm just a child. Have I combined two memories into one? Or is it a dream? I write a poem that begins, I arrived on a hill. I call it Stranded. Some version of this memory sneaks into the poem, just as aura, background. The specificity of the dream dissipates. It takes on the qualities of the poem, infuses itself into the poem, gives the poem something, and the poem gives it something back, a place to reside in a different pitch. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Lindsay, and everyone at Future Poem for inviting me to join you tonight. It's such an honor and pleasure, and I've already enjoyed your readings, Sid and Max, so much. So, um, so I am going to read one of my poems, and um, it's a poem that I wrote, or the nugget came to me as I was just about to fall asleep one night and I had to struggle to make a decision about whether I was gonna try and write it down or just fall asleep and let it go and sleep one and I lost the poem. And the poem had something to do with scabs, all I knew. And then the next day, Laylee Long Soldier posted something about scabs on Facebook and it brought the poem back and I wrote it down. And so it's dedicated to Laylee and it's called Board Game. Who is ready to begin this round? Only girl I, who was lucky enough to have her scab fall off just this morning. It's still a little soft, but anyway, she is the one who gets to go first. Gets to go first. An elbow scab is not as big as a knee scab, but is good enough to get her firmly on the board. Until the others arrive, she has free reign on this board of dead blood. And by the time she leaves it, her detached scab will have hardened quite nicely. Girls A through J, with the exception of girl I, all sit Tyso style around the perimeter of the board. The game moves ahead without them as each girl waits for her scab to fall off so that she might have a piece with which to play. There is a palpable friction in the air between those who bled specifically for this purpose 
and those whose injuries were of natural causes. Also for those whose scabs are soon to fall off and those whose wounds are so fresh that they are bound to be here for a long time. They are the ones who have brought their own food, sleeping bags and sanitary products, lest they lose their spot or be caught elsewhere at the fateful moment when the scab comes off. There are always maybe one or two girls who have had their wounds professionally inflicted so as to produce the largest scabs that will fall off in the briefest amount of time. Although these practices are universally frowned upon, such participants are too busy staring at their attenuated injuries to take any heed or reflect upon their misdeeds. Sometimes there is a lull in the activity and an old gentle man arrives quietly with the breeze. He carries an old fashioned epidermis knife and asks with his eyes if anyone would like some assistance. He hums a tune. He sounds like an ice cream truck. It sounds familiar. Over time, most of the girls make it onto the board, though by the time girl E finally makes her way there, girl I and girl A are already on their second scabs. Girl B explains exactly how things work around here to girl E. Whenever a girl manages to get a scab all the way to the goal, it is a small win. The scab piece is removed from the board and thrown into a nearby pool. In fact, right next to the site of the board game. This game has been going on for quite a number of years and the pool is filling up with the used dead scabs of girls. Over time, each girl will get her turn to swim in the pool of discarded scabs. According to legend, the experience is quite various. Some find themselves crying at the collected sufferings of girls, while others find it liberating to recall all that they have been through as they reach the other side. Those with sensitive skin feel pricked by the jagged edges of the hard, dry scabs, whereas others find it easy enough to breaststroke their way through it all, as that is the recommended stroke for girls swimming through a pool of scabs. Okay, and now I am going to boldly um, read a little bit from the book we are celebrating. And, um, I'm going to read from a section that is called Cartesian Products, Coordinates and Fragments. Um, I'll read two pages. I feel a little bit nervous reading Lindsay's work in front of Lindsay, but um, since the door was open, I'm going to give it a go. R. Moon, moon equals moon, moon. Door, moon. Dear, moon. Dear, doll. Oh, how. I have mooned over you, but in my folly, failed to capture one lock of your feigned sleep, oh, Han Moon Chang Man, but one mean word. And you send me into orbit. And how? I have waited to cross the magpie bridge, if only to slap your withered white buttock into rapturous bloom and how I have longed to run to you like mangled deer through the doorway of your mouth. Ne moon, I weave my wires through the loopholes of your language and your belt loops and moon over the 
you've cast over my cold children over me. R, gum, gum equals today sauntered, melancholy saw persimmons, grown heavy, bulbous, gnarled limbs hived with persimmons, mal, rin, sailors, rife, with persimmons, persimmons, so full the skin, ban dumion, tenda, like, a full bladder and sailors, weighed with muscle, persimmons, slobber for whale fat, to hold between tongue and lip. Any whale, as long as it's fat, a dolphin will do as well. The difference is in the legs, the ability to grow persimmons, to cram. Poppies in the pockets, see. Poppies all abloom on the waves, see foam. Grow clean, creamy with teeth, economic possibilities. Bounty, feast, inheritance, gumption. Pulgun, ko, kokam. That broad flesh pebbled with persimmons, so that gnomon of fruit so close sometimes. Go choron talgom hage could almost understand. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, wow, so I thought that was so amazing. Max said, it so, yeah, it's so great to be here with all of you. Lynn, Lindsay, I'm so excited. I can't wait to hold Transverse myself. I'm so excited that it's in the world. Um, yeah, we've sort of started this journey together at the same time. And um, yeah, it, it, it feels like we've come to a point together now and it's really nice and it's um yeah and it's just great to be with the future form team as well and it's, yeah i'm um gonna read uh a poem from akila oliver's august um uh brenda ajima sent me a copy um just when i moved to amsterdam and it's I've been holding it close since it's nice to um, bring it into the spaces invited by you, Lindsay. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. I'm <laughs> yeah, my mic is weak. Thus speak in these open chambers, my dear. Be not indecisive, furthermore, break the cautionary door. Situate my ethereal body in borrowed cushions, a review found that an investigation of news leaks down Cumberland Street to expand the nation's medical stockpile, finding where the question is, these were in fact quotations from a medieval text, which do not in any way express my personal moments, happen within the moment thought. One, three, two, we represent these traces, Lafayette reasserts. Mastery, do these eyes live place as a series of windows, my own port of literal and other frames for your unnarratives call to connect memory as a device, form as device, 
the deserts, figurative and imaginary passageways, said it appeared to be the first time a Pope has made such a direct apology. Um, and I'm gonna read from all Peach. <laughs> um, and then I want, there's a new thing that I kind of wanna try out because I haven't read a new thing in a long time. Um, We dyed our linens black, poorly, but nonetheless, we'll try again. My stained hands now know something like truth, that it fades. How you stumble upon the glistening, how the glistening chooses you. Paid in full dew droplets in due time, an overwater overture, breakneck brook oat. You're in good company, moon dribble in the morning. Work out the sleep in your back. Sometimes I lose track of my hair and see roaches ruby eyed running. We load your library and drift into lone dark sibling. How the sun mirrors, how the sun greets, shimmer burn, rear view revelation, polar blue document only we can read. Fixed space, fixed mouth, and the fixer sink in silver asymptotes slipping off the paper and opera in every one of us. When it comes, how are you? Home is behind you. I am with you. We will make it to the screaming willow. I want all or nothing. I want the oyster meat and the pearl, the ocean and their offspring. I'm a different beast here. I make my own light. The eruption ensures more melt earth crevice and floor folds, a darkness impassable and I had half the heart to destroy you. It was not my ministry. When I thought I was moving slowly, I could move slower and still. You're the devil I need. So I sit here in this already Atlantis with many mouth, many mothers. We maroons wear marigolds in our hair and bondage in our pockets. And I didn't mean to kill the mosquitoes. I love a blood oath. If you ask first, the breeze through my arm hair, you smell of outside. Hopefully I'll be healed of my stench, my palm at light speed to sense, my own leather. And these things are never where I left them last. Remedies three, not a dream, but a memory. In the eclipse, it is fine for now, just beyond the bridge, but still at a center. Snow shelf before avalanche, electric cloud from up above, on and off again, cruising in potent quiet, spacious yet collective, zero cumulus, how we learn to live under frigid conditions. What made it bearable, lovely even, was how efforted one step solid in any direction, elbows a kinder. Unique awareness in our perfect flailing space, you by my side of your own volition, humbling to me, humming to me. At its end, a certain we exit new, committed to fragrant possibility at an arm's length across an ocean, should it be that way for a time. Thank you. Hi everyone. So I want to begin by reading from Etel Adnan's uh, book, The Spring Flowers Own, O-W-N. Um, she died November 14th of last year. Her ashes now lie on the slopes of Mount Tamalpais and her spirit is everywhere. I, I want to also say that her poems that she she's known as, as both a poet and a painter, and her paintings are an expression of the absolute unadulterated joy of life. And almost all her writings are about the sadness of war and death. 
And curiously, this particular sequence, and I'm only going to read a tiny bit from it, um, reflects both. This unfinished business of my childhood, this emerald lake from my journey's other side, haunts hierarchies of heaven. Laurels and lilacs bloom around my head because I stood up to the sun. You see, the Colorado River runs between flowered banks. I repeat my journeys to seek the happiness that overcame your absence. I was happy not to love you anymore until the sunset reached the east and broke my raft apart. There were other rivers underground covered with dead flowers. It was cold, it was cold. Yes, it was cold. Under the combination of pain and machine gun fire, flowers disappeared. They are in the same state of non-being as Emily Dickinson. We the dead have conversation in our gardens about our lack of evidence. I left the morning paper by the coffee cup the heat was 85, like the year, and I went to the window that flowers had bloomed overnight to replace the bodies felled in the war. The enemy had come with fire and ruse to stamp the names of the dead in the gardens of Yomur. It is not because spring is too beautiful that will not write what happens in the dark. A butterfly came to die between two stones at the foot of the mountain. The mountain shed shadows over it to cover the secret of death. And now I want to read from a work in progress, just a, a part of it and edit it slightly for this reading. Um, and the title is Long Pacific. When we imagine looking out over an expanse, letting our, so letting our sight surf a roiling existence, you look out at a cavernous dark whose inky surface ripples, undulates and shifts as it is doing now. But if downward, then I'm swept into malaise, slight nausea and dizziness and fear of my own vanity with its illusory faces and fantasy ideals. It is with just such vanity that we here call ourselves the authors, I among them, composing a work or lack of work in which we are either proxy agents acting of necessity or under orders, which we may not know we've received, to provide evidence or accounts of acts and accounts of others when what we are witnessing is the ongoing process of all accounts and all evidence, ours included, as well as hers, and that of something else, each the effect and trace of whatever, just as sunlight gives us shadows or the overcast sky unbinds us from the ground. Every point of view depends on a point to view, and it hovers somewhere beyond the viewer casting reality into the milieu, true or false, or only a phase or indeed just a phrase, find the phrase. Sentences no longer strengthened by strife disintegrate, a process Empedocles, that ancient pre-Socratic philosopher of two forces and a stuff of stuff, would have identified as the effect of love, which has the power to to dissipate virtue, and thus I adorn disasters with flowers. There we see the reader, he, she, they, for whom the poem is being written, who swoons as you, yields to the raptures of what she calls the aesthetic. And now we will move a long way toward understanding the pathology governing literature. It involves a lot more masochism than you'd suppose. But there it is. 
And here we realize that we were getting off on personal subjection. We we're getting fucked by the text. The disintegration of ego is going to continue. I may sound there like a modern pop singer, but she will not demand that the public be interested in my personal condition. Unlike those individuals marking through territory given over to individualists who force their personality into their poetry. Poetry is not for you, concealed autobiography. And in any case, she no longer has any need of herself. That spiteful trickster, angel disguised as a bitch, a sparrow, as she puts it, nibbling at her lips, the penis a bird at hand. Time goes with its long wit whipping noodles. Everything is doing something. Being is a condition of wild activity. So there are riots, free to bet, free to bet, stop the pipe, chop from the top. Then a protester gets punched and belts out the song of a meadowlark on a fence that cannot separate the rattlesnake grass from the thistles or the cow parsley from the calf. With that said, losses are real, even in the phenomenal world where dogs and cat, bread and butter, celery and peanut butter, ice cream and cake, apple pie and automobiles, brooch and branches are inevitable and inseparable. There's so much stuff that trying to take it all in, as they say, can drive one crazy and stuff me to the gills as if I were a goldfish in a pond thick with new hatched tadpoles or a crested newt at the end of a leech feast or some ordinary fish rather than a lion king of animals. Tragedy requires heroic tones. Comedy, the sounds of everyday life as federal officers sneak about, seizing children who have taken off their shoes to run barefoot on the sand and kick through the sliding edges of the surf, rounding them up, loading them into cars or a bus and handing them over to a private public partnership for sorting, reshoeing, and release to the custody of year round boarding schools for the shearing and education that they call enlampment, preparation for bleeding and rage. The body aches, you write, it itches, it is full of fear, it tries and fails to forget itself, but the beholding eye moves freely and without haste, as if it were the air itself with its unlimited reserves of time looking at the sea. But we are really just watching blue marks on a grid, racism, bay leaves, clean sheets, unemployment, bruised elbows, hypochondria, yard sales, droughts, rice cookers, email messages, burnout, mental health crises, capitalism, melting glaciers, toothpaste, pandemics, pine tree, salt, white summer clouds, hand cream, low fat milk, tents, ATMs, gender violence, turnpikes, robins, mass shootings, home repairs, indexes and lists and inventories. Things may rhyme, but aren't identical. And this, says a feminist scholar, four fingers writing glyphs in the air, is to provide the wished for surplus through which to resist being useful and being used. And of course, consciousness responds. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lynn. And thanks so much, um, Sid, Sean, Max, and Sawako. Um, I, yeah. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to start by reading a piece um, from Leslie Scalapino's Considering How Exaggerated Music Is. Um, and I don't always read dedications, but this one's too good to skip. Um, this poem is dedicated to the dog woman who appeared to me in a series of dreams. Consider certain emotions such as falling asleep, I said, especially when one is standing on one's feet, as being similar to fear or anger or fainting. I do. I feel sleep in me is induced by blood forced into veins of my brain. I can't focus. My tongue is numb and so large it is like the long tongue of a calf or the tongue of a goat or of a sheep. What's more, I bleat. Yes, in private, in bed, at night, 
with my head turned sideways on the pillow. No wonder I say that I love to sleep. I want to keep going, but if I do, I won't be able to resist the whole sequence. Um, it was so hard to pick um, to pick a cover to do because so many of my favorite poets are right here and reading. Um, but um, Leslie Scalapino is a poetry hero of mine. I wish I could have met her at some point. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, I just I want to say a little bit before launching into um, the performance that I have for today. Um, which is just, uh, first of all, um, and finally, to thank all of you so much for coming to celebrate um, Transverse. Um, in a way, um, this is also like to introduce the project that I'm working on that I'm going to be reading from or presenting um, today. Um, the book, um, the release of it um, and this celebration feels kind of like going to a kid's birthday party, but you haven't seen this kid in like many years <laughs> since it was a baby. Um, and you're so stressed out and uh, trying to figure out what to um, get this child as a birthday present. Um, and um, again, <laughs> and, and you show up, you, you're like, man, I can't just be like, I remember when you were like uh, so young, you loved baby Einstein here you go, man, here's some baby Einstein. Um, it's been six years and you show up to the house and the party is happening and uh, the kid is still a baby. And that's kind of what it feels like <laughs> doing this reading, if that makes sense. Um, I wrote this book back in 20, uh, 2016 when I was 19. And since then, so much has changed, um, like uh, the world and also um, myself. So it's hard to look back on all of this and feel like, um, it's hard to look back on the writing and feel like celebrating, but it's very easy to um, look at the acknowledgements page and also the object itself and feel like celebrating all of you who've um, been a part of this book. Um, and um, yeah, so this is just to say thank you again to, um, all of the editors at Future Poem, um, everyone who's worked on this object. Um, the writing is mine, but this is ours. And that means so much to me, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, just while I've been trying to figure out um, how to read from this book and still feel, um, and still feel like the work is alive, um, I've been working on an audio, I, I'm turning this into an audio project um, or a sound piece. And I got to present some of it at um, Small Press Traffic's High Dawn reading series last spring. Um, the, um, the audio piece that I constructed around the first poem this book called Phrase is pretty much done. Um, and what I'm going to be sharing is kind of, um, it's a, it's a fairly, um, it's a new mix, I guess. Um, it contains an excerpt of the audio piece um, of phrase and also just the first attempts at um, Cartesian products. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, uh, just, <laughs> sorry, sorry for all the ums and ands, I am very nervous. Um, <laughs> but uh, with that said, I think I'm just gonna launch into it.
Minimalist composer Steve Reich's Piano Phase, 1967, marks Reich's first attempt to apply his phasing technique to live performance. The piece is performed by two pianists who begin by playing identical lines of music, lines to be repeated in cycles for the remainder of the piece, perfectly in sync. Gradually, one pianist will begin to speed up, desynchronize, until the agent of desynchronization is playing exactly one note ahead of their counterpart. This gradual desynchronization is repeated for a full eight cycles. As the piece is considered process music, the process of desynchronization and its resultant discord, that which is not quite pleasing to the ear except in a vaguely intellectual sense, that which is pleasing in its recognizability as a vital part of the process which is the piece, is to be seen as delightful, constructive, aesthetic. To see the process itself as generative, to release the aesthetic object from the role of presenting an aesthetic final product. According to Steve Reich in Music as a Gradual Process, process music is not to be thought of as that which reveals the process of composition, but rather, pieces of music that are literally processes. Parts. That as piano phase is not to be thought of as performance of the process of composition, the work is not performance art in the way that Marina Abramovich's work is performance art. The artist is not present. The burden of final aesthetic product, of which the aestheticization of process has released the process, is reshouldered. The aesthetic product is, after all, the piece, which presents rather than performs process. Parse. Composing process music is not a matter of revealing the process of composing, but a matter of composing a process. Obvious analogies arise. For example, with the aestheticization of growing discord, desynchronization, piano phase models Lacan's eye, Milton's Satan and Eve, Hegel's dialectic, all manners of political discord, revolt, and revolution. I recline in bed and listen to piano phase. I find myself sore and battered from the day's harvest to slights. I foster a pet analogy that the music lies mismatching lexicons in constant amoebic process. After all, synchronization not to be thought of as an act of engulfing. An interruption, a guest, an asset, kin. Everything I have read up to a certain point has hurt me. What had once left me reeling has become a matrix. I walk to the fields and collect my harvest. Now is a matter of finding the exact point and orientation of the hurt. What crop is left unreaped? What doesn't come through on the page is all of the screaming. Anne Boyer writes in Garments Against Women, a friend who has a job as a telephone transcriptionist for people who can't hear has had to face the problem of what to do when one party he is transcribing has sobbed. I face a similar problem, except I'm always, just constantly, screaming, and there's absolutely no way to get it on the page unless I superimpose a large scream over the entirety of each page, which of course has complications thanks to the infinite scroll capabilities of web pages. I simply don't have an infinite scream. Is the obvious analogy with music? Then Hygienian in my life recount childhood with such tenderness. I foster a pet project. I string the garden, pull a thread through the representative leaf of each plant. This, too, is a balm. To understand why it is that certain common sayings are perhaps necessarily untruthful, though not necessarily lies, the most common offender being, I am not just saying this, you are doing exactly that. To quote Lin Shu's debts and lessons, I am not asking you to die for me, they you will die for me.
Oh, look at me. I'm screaming. I am extremely self-conscious. I'm screaming and I can't tell to make me more self-conscious. That certain people are looking at me, or that certain people aren't. I'd have to add other words to more correctly describe the emotion. Scream. Desire. Scream. Shyness. Scream. Screaming. Relation. Moon. 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 Door. Moon. Dear. Moon. Dear doll. Oh, thou. I am mooned over you. But in my folly failed to capture one lock, but were fain to sleep. Oh, unmoon But one mean word, and you send me into orbit. And how? I have waited to cross the magpie bridge. If only slap your withered white buttock into rapturous bloom, and how I have longed to run to you like mangled deer through the doorway of your mouth. Nim, I weave my wires through the loopholes of your language, and your belt loops and moon over the... you've cast over my cold children, over me. Relation. Gum. Gam. Today, saunter, melancholy. Saw persimmons grow happy. Today, saw boulders, gnarled limbs, high persimmons, persimmons, wild mean sailors, right, with persimmons, persimmons, siffle, skin, on to another tongue, like a full ladder, and sailors, weigh with console, like persimmons, slaughter a whale hat, to hold between tongue and tongue, and whale, is lost that, a dolphin would do as well. The difference in the legs, the ability to grow persimmons, the gram poppies in the pockets, sea poppies all bloom the waves, sea foam, grow creamy teeth, economic possibilities, bounty, beast, inheritance, functions. Bounties, and that broad flesh bubbled with persimmons, so that no one ever so close sometimes would tread on them. That would nugget, but almost understand. That would but almost understand. Relation, cool, cool. To think yourself all alone in the cool, all alone in the honey. To think voices let go, marble through honey. To think a cure, a cannibal, cool. To slip a skull through honey, feather in a cup, feather. Honey, skins in a cup, 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 in a skins in a cup, 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 they lick their haunches. Where the hides are white and flickering, all your pigs are just scribbled tasks. I know where you wake and it's inside, and those eyes are straight, and what the giant will say. Will say. A flux. Shut up. Relation. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Sam. Badger. Flicker. Interference. Relation. Mal. Mal. Coordinates. Directions. Data. A wind around. Blue faces. Where the center person appears, one wanders the body of Jesus' name, so one can see the disease.
Thank you. That's what I've been working on. Um, and um, do, you, do you think that I have time to do one last short little shorty? Okay. Um, yeah, this has been a ritual for me ever since I first wrote this poem. Um, it's called Plate after Anna Mashavakis and I read it after every reading. I don't know if I should stop now that the book is out, but um, I do it because it helps me. Plate. Wine, flowers, revelry. To place in a wooden bowl, which epic poets are to drink water from. While lyric poets may enjoy wine and perhaps also flowers and revelry without regard for carnage or with heightened pleasure due to carnage. A particular vagueness entailed in complex, a precursor to grief, eggs in the nest of grief, which must also be placed in a wooden bowl to sun, like flower water, wine collected from a wooden floor, glass in its truest shadow, not a cup, nor a vase, nor a jug, but a lung and sorrow, a bouquet or palette of particular monochrome colors, heart steak, pearl onion, more air, more mores, to relinquish dance, all pray to love in the forgetting that all liquid must be fetched in a wooden bowl from a river into which one can never step twice and find the same river or sameness, though in the forgetting I have fetched body in a bowl from the very stream I have often peered for divination, though I have become uncertain if it is the same river, if it ever has been lined with birches, if the body I have brought back, if it is a body, if it become the same body, if the song I have whispered to the river, if it is indeed a song, if the wooden bowl I have fetched for love or grief or lamentation is the bowl that will fulfill this act of love, if it is an act of love to braid song, braid body, braid river, range. And that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Lindsay, wow. I am, that was incredible. Thank you so much for, for that reading and that performance. Um, I, yeah, incredible work tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Sid and Max and Lynn and Sawako and Sean. Um, thank you to the writers that you called into this space through Lindsay's invitation. Um, this is the book, Transverse. It's phenomenal. It's gorgeous. Um, get a copy and read it. It's beautiful. And thank you for being here to celebrate this book. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>